Should we start now? Yes, please. So can I start? Or yes, yes, please start. Yeah. Please okay, start. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the second of the series that we had started last month on uh, multidisciplinary dreams in child and adolescent mental health. Uh, this one uh, today and the next uh, few that we have planned will be briefer, unlike the first one that we had, which was about three hours or so. Uh, this time it will be very specific, restricted to cases. So there will be two cases, one uh, on ID with aggression and its management, and the second one on specific learning disability. And without further ado, again, I welcome all the multidisciplinary team members who are here, the association members who are here. And uh, I hope we have a good representation of students from the various fields, disciplines, and especially psychiatrists, uh, psychiatry PGs. So good morning. And without any further ado, I think we can go into the first case. Uh, the first case will be moderated by me. And uh, it is case one is aggression in intellectual disability. Here, as I want to just reiterate, we have already discussed it in our groups. The first case presentation will comprise of four slides. The discussion will be of two slides. And each speaker can self-introduce with their slides. I think Dr. Swati will be presenting the slide of the CV. And you can self-introduce and go into your presentation. So we don't waste too much time in introductions. And people know who uh, who is actually speaking then immediately. Uh, so I think the order would be like we discussed last time. It would be the psychiatrist, psychologist, occupational therapist, physiotherapist, speech and language uh, pathologist, and the special educator. The second case I think uh, starts with the discussion because the case was brought in by the special educators team. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll go into case one which is a case of aggression in intellectual disability. Uh, the first person, I think the presentation will be by Dr. Prajakta Patkar, the psychiatrist. Yeah. Can you take over, Prajakta? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, lovely to see uh, so many people on a Sunday morning. Uh, hi, this is, uh, my name is Dr. Prajakta. I work as an assistant professor at uh, uh, at Nile Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, I, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Alka ma'am and Jyoti ma'am and of course the IPS Wesco Child Psychiatry Subcommittee for having me here. And um, I think let's just start with the case. Uh, Hitav, can we have the, right. the next one? Right. So we have uh, an, an, an eight-year-old male child who is already going to a special school was brought in by his mother. Now, the mother says that uh, her boy has behavioral issues like hitting and kicking family members, teachers, uh, kids in the school, throwing and breaking objects in the house in school. Uh, he always has irritable, he's always irritable, even on minor provocation, a lot of stubborn behavior, temper tantrums, often using abusive words, spitting on people, and inability to sit at one place. That's how the mom got it the child next slide please when we do when we dug deeper we uh, we understood that of course it was a normal conception mom was 31 years old dad was 32 years old but mother had a history of oligohydroamnios and pregnancy induced hypertension during her uh, pregnancy and uh, subsequently she was started on antihypertensives during her eight month pregnancy she had to undergo uh, a C-section for uh, because of the hypertension. But even then, uh, it was a full-term birth uh, with delayed cry. He did not cry immediately. Uh, had some history of birth asphyxia, asphyxia as per the mother and had to stay in the NICU for five days for the same. Next slide. 
uh, when we looked at his uh, milestones, currently at eight years of age, he could walk independently. Uh, he could run. However, he had difficulty in hopping, in jumping. Uh, with regards to his fine motor, he could eat with a spoon. Pincer grass was achieved, but uh, he could scribble, uh, but he couldn't draw. He could he couldn't draw standing or sleeping lines. He could he found it difficult in uh, things like things which needed uh, his fine motor grasp, like buttoning, unbuttoning. He could speak, uh, but there was a significant delay. His speech was unclear. Uh, he had a nonverbal communication, which was good enough. Uh, cognitively, he could understand basic colors, shapes, animals, uh, but he did not have the knowledge of numbers or alphabets. He could identify body parts though. Uh, with, in social settings, he could understand basic social, uh, how to greet people. He would try to interact with other kids, but would often get into fights. He would not understand turn taking. And, you know, that's why uh, there were a lot of fights at school with his peers. With regards to toilet training, he was independent. Uh, his, uh, but he needed help in cleaning. Uh, and hence the mother still, you know, insisted on him wearing a diaper rose. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so the reason why the mom got him here especially was because of the behavioral problems, uh, both at school and at home. They, She said that earlier they were mild and they had increased significantly in the last two years. At home, he would often be kicking and punching if he would be asked to do things around the home. He would use abusive words, which was not tolerable to them. He would uh, have demanding behavior. And if the demands were not met, there would be tantrums. Uh, you know, he would run, roll on the floor. He would be crying badly. Frequent anger outbursts without provocation also many times. And he would be throwing objects around the home. This was at home. And at school, the teachers often complained that he would never obey instructions, couldn't sit in one place. If he did not like an activity, he would be throwing those activity material around, using abusive words, again, screaming, shouting, especially if he was tried uh, to, di to discipline. Next slide. Um, so when, when, of course, when we went more uh, into the details, the parents, both of them and the grandparents, it was a joint family, all of them, uh, their style of parenting was quite permissive. A lot of family conflicts between the mother and the grandparents. A grandfather often used abusive language in the house and, of course, in front of the child as well. The child was going to a special school now since the last one year, like because he couldn't cope up with going to the normal school, which they did try. Uh, the child had received a few months of OT therapy in the past, but uh, they had discontinued for some reason. There was no other significant medical comorbidity. Right. With this, what we are uh, looking at from the history and from the complaints is uh, maybe a case of intellectual disability. And if we, uh, if we, if we look at the diagnostic criteria of DSM, it fits more into moderate severity. Of course, DSM uh, says that uh, the, the severity has is based on adaptive scoring, uh, adaptive uh, functioning, and not on IQ scores. Uh, apart from the intellectual disability, yes, there were signs of ADHD as well, and that happens very often that along with the intellectual disability, Almost 30 to 40 percent of the times there is another psychiatric comorbidity. More often than not, ADHD, uh, conduct or uh, op oppositional defiance disorder, uh, any other seizure disorder, and hence uh, it's it's always better to have uh, both diagnosis into consideration. Next slide, please. Right. So when um, a, a a case like this would come. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, to the clinic or to your setup. It's important that we have a detailed history, uh, you know, into consideration. Because if we look at the uh, etiology of intellectual disability, there are, uh, it can be prenatal, 
there can be prenatal factors, there can be perinatal factors, there can be acquired or social, uh, psychosocial factors as well. And hence, we need a detailed history which starts right from uh, the prenatal conception period. Uh, how did the how did they conceive? Uh, what there any any other medical uh, problems in the mother? Which in this case we already saw that she had a difficult pregnancy. Uh, any other uh, disorders or diseases which were detected? Any infections during pregnancy, um, etc. Uh, he, this child also did have birth asphyxia and that is also another very important uh, etiology of uh, intellectual disability. Uh, apart from that, yes, uh, we do need to have, a, 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 you know, like a three generational pedigree charting because a lot of times um, intellectual disability has a genetic, um, uh, you know, predisposition and there are there can be multiple people in the family who might have uh, maybe some degree of intellectual dis uh, dis disability um apart from that we we do need to have a thorough physical examination and the reason for this is because there are a lot of genetic syndromes which would uh, have intellectual disability as a, a, you know as a part of their syndrome and right, it can be Down syndrome, fragile legs, final ketonuria, multiple of them, but uh, they will have uh, some dysmorphic features which should not be missed out because there can also be other medical uh, comorbidities if there is a genetic syndrome. It's very important to have a thorough physical examination along with other basic investigations. I would also like to look for neurological soft signs uh, in this case because there are a lot of times where these kids have a certain degree of uh, neurological um, uh, disorders and uh, they might have these neurological soft signs which might be missed if we don't actively look out for them. A lot of them have seizure, history of seizures. Maybe some of them, the parents do not pick them up. And it's 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 uh, very it would be wise if we if we would also have neuroimaging done and EG uh and an uh, EG done uh, as a part of our evaluation. A genetic evaluation may be done in case uh someone uh you know if that if it is a genetic syndrome if you're looking at a genetic syndrome and of course if the parents might want to uh, consider having another child so. It's always best if they have that done. Uh, so here again, uh, if we looked at this case, uh, we I would want to have more details about the perinatal and prenatal history, three degree pedigree charting, and the thorough physical Next slide, please. So more often than not, when we get these kids to the clinic, the parents. Many of the times when you ask them, what are you actually looking at? Why have you got them here? Is because they would say that, oh, uh, you know, I uh, we would we would like to see if you can if you can treat this. So it's it's very important that uh, we psychoeducate the family that intellectual disability. I of course we can work with it, we can work around it, but if at all it is an intellectual disability, how? We need to give them a realistic picture of what what exactly can be done and what can't be done, and and th that is where our management starts. Um, of course, we can we do have uh, medicines to control the hyperactivity. We do have medicines to control the aggressiveness, but at the bottom of the uh, uh, at, at you know below all of this, uh, it is more about working with. Uh, the capacity of the child and the parent, and then making, uh, you know, making every day and the future more, you know, practically, uh, you know, oriented. So, uh, you know, maybe a, a thorough behavioral analysis is necessary. This child had a lot of behavioral, uh, you know, temper tantrums. There were a lot of behavioral problems, both at school and at home. And it's it's very uh, it's 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 you know wise that we actually sit down with the parent and 
tease out these uh, these behaviors and how are they occurring what are the what are what are the antecedents how do the parents react how do the grandparents react especially because the mother and grandparent not getting along which we see uh, so often in indian families parenting techniques again uh, very important uh, otherwise also but especially when it comes to a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, it it becomes it, it becomes essential that we work uh, with the parents on this of course uh, at the school as well um, the teachers find it uh, you know very difficult to work with these kids uh, 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 this child was already going to a special school it becomes more difficult for for the teachers when there are so many of them and they need to handle that uh, so, you know, as a psychiatrist, I would want to also liaise with the school and maybe if, uh, you know, we can rope them into the treatment plan that would really help both the uh, parent and the teacher. Um, apart from that, of course, uh, I think with, when it comes to a child uh, like this, when they come, uh, you know, with this kind of a presentation, it's, it's, uh, we do need to work with an occupational therapist. We do need to work with a physiotherapist, a speech therapist, a special educator. And the importance of their role in, in handling this child is, is, is I think, uh, you know, of great uh, importance, which most parents don't understand. They're just coming to you and they're asking, Ki, isko kar do, ya to iska, you know, uh, just... Uh, aggression kam kar do, but that's not about it. We do need to reiterate to them that you need these therapies. It's important that you do these therapies because we are not just looking at reducing the aggression, but we need a, a definitive plan for them so that we can work on whatever capability and whatever, uh, you know, intelligence, intellectual capacity they do have. And then how do we work for it? Next slide. So just, just to sum it up, uh, when, when a child with intellectual disability comes to us, it, they can come at different stages of, you know, of life. And when they come as newborns, it's, it's mostly just the dysmorphic features and maybe some uh, other multiple organ dysfunctions. When they come in infancy, they, uh, you know, it's more often than that they're not able to interact with the environment. And that's how uh, the parents get them, uh, you know, having problems with vision, hearing, other sensory symptoms. Uh, when they come in later infancy, maybe just motor delay. Toddlers come with just language delays or, you know, uh, uh, some difficulties in coping up with the surroundings. But when they when they move to preschool, that's when, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it gets more uh, obvious because the parents then start seeing behavioral symptoms because they cannot get along with other people, because they can't get along with all the other kids. And uh, that's that's when, uh, you know, most of them will approach, uh, you know, any kind of profession. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all that I wanted to say, but it's important that we work with all, uh, uh, you know, with, with a multidisciplinary team um, when we approach a, a case of intellectual disability and we make sure that we we explain the parents how important it is to not just give them medication, but also consider taking these therapies extremely seriously. Okay. Uh, thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prajita. That was extremely detailed. And I would like to emphasize here that a three-generation history, whether there's consanguinity or otherwise, that needs to be recorded, especially for the psychiatry PGs here. Uh, the next uh, in line, I think what we would like, I, as Dr. Prajekta said, we need to have a multidisciplinary team here working together. And obviously, for a child with ID, with uh, behavioral problems, with aggression, uh, you know, we all know that we need to refer to the psychologist on the team. So next in line is uh, Ms. Mansi Joshi, uh, who can introduce herself, who's a psychologist, who will be discussing uh, the intervention from a psychologist's perspective for this case. Uh, Mansi, I would also to. request you, because yes. since Prajekta went on into details about what is required to be done in an assessment, if you could just briefly sum up in two lines about the case that we are discussing here. In fact, even for the, all the speakers, you know, so that we keep the link 
uh, amongst the speakers because then you know the details of this case may be lost yeah okay okay yeah sure. thank you ma'am uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, here thank you to ips as well as psychologist collective from which uh, i am a member and that is why i am here to talk about this case and thank you so much dr prajakta for that elaborate uh, detailed case analysis as well as uh, the details of assessment as well. So this is uh, me, I'm master's in clinical psychology from University of Mumbai and uh, currently working with BYL Nair Charitable Hospital since last eight years. Before that, I've worked with schools and colleges in various capacities as counselors and as counselor and as well as teacher. Uh, next slide, please. So like uh, ma'am uh, just now said that briefly we would go on to, this is an eight-year-old boy currently referred to us with complaints of behavioral uh, difficulties, including hitting aggression towards uh, people as well as not being able to sit quietly in the class, not being able to focus. And there are a lot of developmental as well as uh, adaptive functioning uh, uh, delays. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so aggression, when we are talking of aggression, I think necessarily there are three ways in which aggression can be divided. So aggression can be towards others or destructive, they can be destructive, destructive behaviors and aggression can be towards oneself. So in this particular case, we've seen that the child is able, you know, child is hitting others, kicking his family members, children in his school. So that is the aggression that is directing towards the others. In the case, there are behavioral issues which are destructive and disruptive in nature, uh, which involve breaking of objects, throwing things, beaming, breaking windows, etc., which are destructive and disruptive behaviors. As well as third part is the, uh, the aggression that is directed towards oneself, which can involve biting or other SIVs that we talk about uh, as head banging or biting oneself, etc., now we see that the first two, uh, uh, first two aggression. Please stay on the same slide. Uh, the first two uh, components, like the the aggression that is towards others and the uh, one that is destructive and disruptive in nature, they can be further divided into the planned aggression or reactive aggression. Why I'm reiterating this is because the planned kind of aggression, which is you know. Uh, towards others or the other behaviors which are planned in nature are very rarely seen in children in, with IDs. They are mostly seen in children who have um, who have uh, conduct issues or ODD uh, complaints. So most often the aggression that we see in children with IDs is reactive in nature. It's not planned in nature. It's most often it's reactive, and the uh, the reason could be that the common triggers are usually pain or most uh, important element in ID is inability to comprehend the minor event. So the reaction to uh, comprehend the event is most often a turn into aggression. So uh, as I am told briefly to uh, run over assessments, next slide please. Assessment then will involve, uh, like Dr. Prajapta mentioned, a very comprehensive history taking, which will involve not just uh, current functioning, but also the past history of birth, developmental, uh, family history, and academic history of the child. In uh, assessment, particularly for aggression, it will also involve triggers, onset, and development of aggressive behaviors, setting in which it occurs, the setting in which the, this behavior occurs, because we want to target aggression per se. So it will involve uh, assessment of uh, disciplinary strategies. What parents do when the child reacts in that particular manner? What others around him do uh, when the child reacts in that particular manner? It will also involve details of how much screen time the child is watching. What is the child watching on the screen? <laughs> uh, so assessment, normal assessment, but, but it will also involve all these details. Uh, definitely IQ assessment is a is a very uh, integral part of the work that we do as psychologists. But there are challenges in IQ assessment when it comes to the child who has, you know, who we have uh, clinically diagnosed already as ID and needs uh, assessment. So assessment is not just required. Obviously, we need it for certification and obviously we need it for documentation purpose, etc., but also we need it for tracking the progress. Also, we need it for planning interventions because the interventions uh, would work differently uh, with different uh, 
level of intelligence naturally a child with bif uh, level of intelligence uh, will will respond to different intervi interventions and as compared to child who we just saw a mild to moderate um, kind of intellectual disability is our uh, probable diagnosis here so these children would uh, need different kind of interventions so iq assessment has its own challenges because uh, this child has uh, no verbal skills this child is not um, developed language as of now uh, he is socially otherwise um, you know inter interested in other children so when we are looking at different dds a differential diagnosis that uh, rajata also mentioned it involves uh, say global developmental delay it involves asd because the child has uh, delay in speech and other uh, head banging sort of behaviors it also has adhd conduct traits adhd and odd traits uh, so the assessment in, is comprehensive and it will involve adhd rating scales like corners this one that i have just put in here is adhd t or adhd 2 which is a very detailed assessment which is based on dsm uh, the uh, picture above that is of uh, sanguine form board we all are aware of and as redundant as it may sound to all of us who are very inclined towards using more detailed assessments of Weschler's and Wisp4's and uh, Malin's assessments etc. In this particular case I don't think we are left with any other option because the child is not verbal. And we need to rely on uh, uh, on form board. Of course, like the government guidelines say, we need uh, uh, social functioning also. So we would do BSMS as well. Uh, CBCL is one checklist, child behavior checklist that, that I have named. But there are many others which we can use. And these are talking about. So question is of a recent onset it can have a physical or or emotional cause if the child has started to uh, uh, to behave uh, aggressively re in recent times then the cause can be something say say a pain in uh, in uh, some part of the body or it can be emotional like the birth of another sibling a child born in the family etc but if it's of a gradual onset if it's ongoing if it's increasing uh, in frequency and in in uh, uh, in tendency then it is probably more related to um, intellectual functioning of the child. So in interventions, uh, going ahead with intervention plan, first foremost, definitely behavioral approach uh, is going to work, which will assess the consequences uh, of the behavior. So which would target the uh, what happens, like I said. So we see that the behavior um, modification is usually based on re rewards and punishment uh, methods. But what works but that works better with children who have planned aggression, uh, who have conduct issues, who have uh, ODD uh, as a diagnosis. How family members react to a tantrum is most important here in behavioral approach. Uh, because, uh, see, whenever parents have told me that the child throws a tantrum for a thing and he, you know, rolls over the floor and he screams and shouts, my first question would always be, what do you do next? Parents uh, describe a lot what child does. What do you do when he does that? So uh, we give it. They say that we have to give it. We give that thing. So a question follows that why should the child not do what he's doing then? Why should a child not throw a tantrum then? So uh, because he's getting what he wants. So for reactive kind of aggression, uh, eliminating the triggers and changing the setting would work more than the reward punishment with the child. So involving the family members to eliminate the kind of uh, settings uh, or change the settings is going to work more in case of ID. So teaching an alternative or more acceptable behavior, setting boundaries to the behavior is especially necessary for children uh, who have, uh, you know, speech difficulties definitely because the child is not able to communicate what he wants. The child is not able to state what he wants or what he's feeling like. So more often we see the children who have speech delays kind of express themselves a lot uh, with their hands. And that also in physical form. Uh, so then they will grab another child because they want to love him, but that is very aggressive for the other child. Uh, so they, we need to set boundaries. We need to teach children um, you know, how to, uh, you know, set. so that that's where the next component comes in. Emotional regulation training is required. Research has found that children uh, with ID also can recognize their own emotion. 
certain children with say mild ID can also read other people's facial expressions. But the problem is expression of emotion. The problem is how it's the failure to regulate the anger. Uh, so we can teach some techniques which would help them regulate uh, this emotion of anger. So simple emotions children can recognize. Um, so again, the cognitive behavioral, the cognitive approach towards emotional regulation is a little difficult for children who have uh, um, uh, ID as their diagnosis because we are talking especially in children uh, aggression in ID children. So uh, more behavioral uh, techniques of emotion regulation, say relaxation techniques, stop think and relax techniques are some of the uh, techniques that can be more useful. Uh, since we have to work a lot with family, we have to work a lot with parents in first place. Psychoeducation is therefore extremely important to set these appropriate boundaries, set the expectations correctly. Again, that would de de uh, depend on the level of intellectual functioning what a child can, uh, what a parent can expect out of a child academically as well as behaviorally and emotionally. So psychoeducating them about that, understanding the nature of problems, understanding that it is uh, it is not going to get cured with a medicine. Uh, there is no medicine that is going to help them increase the intelligence. It's going to help them regulate these behaviors and control aggression in the first place. So wherever necessary, the uh, intervention can be more in pharmacological nature as well. Uh, parenting style, we have seen that it's a permissive parenting style. The history states that parents are faulty. Uh, you know, there can be faulty role, mo role models around. So this is a picture of the probably grandfather who's abusive towards, uh, you know, we've seen in the history that the grandfather was very abusive towards the, uh, towards the daughter-in-law. And then that is a behavior that is also learned behavior. So permissive parenting style also needs to be looked upon and uh, dealt with in uh, in intervention. Uh, so often parents complain that they are not on same page when it comes to Indian family settings. The decision maker is somebody else. The decision maker is a grandfather or a grandmother usually. So involving all of them in a family intervention program, in a family therapy is extremely important. Going on to the next point, uh, caregivers, uh, skill training and support is extremely uh, necessary. Can we have the next points please on the same slide? Parents require uh, skills. See, parenting is is hard, and parenting is not taught in school. Uh, so, and parenting an aggressive child that too with intellectual diff difficulty is harder. So, uh, hence training them is extremely necessary. Parent may themselves suffer from a lot of guilt, from a lot of exhaustion, from a lot of helplessness and anger themselves. So, psychiatric referral may be sometimes necessary for the parents as well. Uh, support groups for parents with ID have worked excellent uh, in our settings and uh, in hospitals we do a lot of uh, support groups. So support groups work excellent in uh, realizing that similar complaints, you know, you know, you are not uh, the only one. Similar complaints other parents also have and how they have uh, dealt with them. So it's a learning through uh, exchange of information and experiences. Also, I've seen that it's extremely cathartic for parents when they talk about their problems in a similar uh, uh, you know, group where other parents also understand and go through the same. Uh, going on to the next point, reference to other experts, like we've always said that that's why we are here. It's a multidisciplinary team. So reference to other experts would involve OT, speech, uh, medicines if required in case of ADHD, aggression that does not respond to behavior uh, modification, and if it's self-injurious in nature. So, uh, of course, with school counselors, the referrals is necessary in order to integrate this child better in school setting and also to eliminate triggers and uh, monitor setting in a school environment. Um, so, referrals to other experts are extremely crucial. In case of ID, assessment and referrals, assessment and intervention is not always linear. It can go back and forth because we need to stabilize, increase the sitting tolerance of the child first. So, maybe OT would come in first, then go on to behavior modification. So, it has to be a flexible kind of approach. What is extremely important at the end also is to uh, monitor symptoms over lifespan because... Uh, See, there are the children with aggression are at risk for other psychiatric uh, illnesses like uh, bipolar, like psychosis, maybe early onset, like 
learning issues like uh, substance abuse in adulthood so monitoring them over the lifespan is also extremely important when we have diagnosed them with id and we have diagnosed them with aggression uh, so this comprehensive kind of intervention yeah. strategies which are uh, definitely towards the id is uh, extremely essential and i think i'll end with that yeah. and go on uh, yeah. and thank you so thank much you. for being patient. thank you very much mansi we will quickly go into the next uh, for the next speaker that's dr mansi kadam who's an occupational therapist i would request the speakers to keep uh, themselves limited to their time please uh, because we are already running out of time for the first case itself yes mansi you can continue uh, hello everyone i'm mansi kadam and uh, I'm a gold medalist at my uh, at MEHS in Masters in Developmental Disabilities, and I have uh, five years of clinical experience. Uh, I'll start with the assessment because we have been talking about what is happening and what are the behaviors which we see. So, as an occupational therapist point of view, uh, we divide this into three different components: the performance areas, performance patterns, or skills which are needed to you know to have an adaptive functioning or to to be independent in any of the uh, daily life. So here we know the child is dependent on most of the uh, most of his ADL tasks. So as an occupational therapist, our, uh, our aim is to find out what is the reason the child is not able to do, for example, bathing, dressing, eating, or for example, for that matter, toileting. Uh, whether there are any sensitive, uh, like sensory issues, whether the child is hyperreactive or hyperreactive to any of the vestibular, proprioceptive, or tactile stimulus. So we need to uh, find that through uh, through interviews or through observation, how the child is reacting to a particular stimulus. Uh, so for example, if I may give an example for eating, uh, we, we, have, we know that the child can eat with spoon, uh, but if if it, if in the house the child is expected to eat with uh, with his hands, uh, dal rice, uh, chapati sabzi, whether the child has hypersensitivity and because of which he is not, you know, putting his hands into dal rice because he doesn't like the texture. Uh, he sometimes it happens he doesn't like the mixed texture of both the uh, stimulus. So uh, we need to understand the environment. We need to see what are the expectations on the child. Uh, so the detailed observation, detailed interview from parents uh, is uh, is needed at this stage. Again, uh, how the child is, so we know the child has a difficulty sitting at one place and uh, as Ms. Mansi said that he, he is into the reactive zone. So we know that there is a lot of impulsivity when it comes to, uh, when it comes to any of the situation, the child would react immediately. Again, with, with respect to the cognitive aspect, and this is happening with respect to my education or my play activity. So he, he likes to play with other kids, but he's, he doesn't know how to interact, whether to wait for my turn. or And again, we, we know there's a difficulty with communication with this child. Uh, so that might lead to you know frustration and aggression because sometimes it happens that the child wants to say something and uh, the parents or the other people around interpret it in a different language and the, because the child is not able to communicate that effectively we know the aggression comes in uh, so the, the basic occupation where which in which the child is able to perform certain activities and why he is not able to perform certain activities so we all know the how the environment around the child is. The parenting style is permissive. So he is learning a lot of behavior from the family. And because of which the, the reaction which he is giving to the others or in the school is similar to uh, what is happening and what he is seeing. So this is again an example of modeling the behavior which which you know uh, which he is taking into and then he is reacting onto that. Uh, the performance skills. So we know the gross motor skills and fine motor. Whether the child is able to imitate, uh, he, whether he can copy uh, what has been taught to him. Uh, for that, how is the attention? How is the uh, how is the tone of the body? Most of the cases I've seen uh, with ch children who are on ID, they are hypotonic, means we, which they are not able to use their uh, you know proprioceptive system effectively. Which in turn leads to alertness of my brain, which might, which in turn affects my attention span. Uh, there's a distractibility. 
So uh, we need to see how the motor skills are, how the sensory skills are. We talked about the uh, hyper and hyper responsiveness, but again, how is the sensory processing of any of the sensory stimulus? Whether the child is taking a lot of time to process information and then to react, and sometimes it happens that you know uh, we don't know where the child lies and uh, or the teachers or the family members tries to give instruct multiple instructions and that sometimes can cause confusion to the child and because his processing speed is delayed he, he might it might come as an you know a lot of a uh, lot of information and a lot of things onto myself and i'm not able to comprehend and you know, give a better result out of it. And expectations keep on in increasing. That might lead to frustration and again, all the aggressive behaviors. Um, here I just mentioned few of the skills, like also Ms. Mansi mentioned about corners, parent writing skills, which will like, give us an idea about what, where the aggression is or what is the intensity in terms of my impulsivity, my attention, my hyperactivity, um, sensory profile, just to rule out uh, what sensory level the child is. Uh, we feel the scale for my uh, self care or ADL task. Uh, so, these occupational therapists use uh, majority goal attainment scales and COPN. So, these are the scales which gives us uh, basically it's, it's our family centric approach. So, in the assessment, we ask the parents, see what is your, you know, right now goal. Uh, for us to work on. So if sometimes parents say, you know, at least he should be independent in most of the tasks uh, or he should stop hitting, the behavior should reduce. So in goal at, uh, attainment skills and COPM, we need we write down the goals and, uh, you know, through a three months or six months uh, span, we see with what level we have achieved. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in terms of intervention, so, uh, you know, through through my assessment, I know uh, how is the how is the environment the child lives in, how is my gross motor skills, how is my practice like motor planning skills, how is my fine motor skills, uh, how is the emotional understanding, emotional regulation, and again the environment. Uh, again, uh, if 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 it's if it's possible, we can communicate with the school staff, school counselors, school teachers to see how in what environment the child is in. If there is a hot auditory hyper sensitivity and there's a too much of noise because of which the child is shouting screaming uh, not doing work at school so that needs to be taken care of uh, so intervention first and foremost is always uh, i always tell this to my parents whenever there is a behavior which we see uh, you know with, uh, let's call it as a negative behavior which is happening uh, please start by validating the emotion validating the child's feelings that i understand that you are feeling upset you are angry uh and this has happened and again not using too, too much of language or not using too long sentences but but just a short version so that uh the child can understand uh so here the parents can speak slowly with their facial expressions with their body language they can convey the child that you know i understand this is happening but what we can do is, so you are not allowed to shout, you're not allowed to scream. Maybe we can say, you can hug mama. Maybe we can play with the other things. Maybe you can drink a glass of water, uh, deep pressure activities like, you know, uh, uh, hugging a pillow, things like that. So always start with that. Again, many of the times it happens that because there's a, there unexpected uh, expect unexpected behaviors are there or uh, there is a lot of expectation from the child which might come, you know, suddenly. Uh, so I always tell the parents, like, if we can prepare a visual schedule for the child so that he will understand, okay, these are my expectations and these are the things which I need to follow. That will also help in reducing the uh, aggressive behaviors. So for, for an ADL, uh, if I may give you an example, for example, for bathing and my child is not able to, you know, bathe himself independently uh, because he sometimes he doesn't like the texture. Sometimes it happens that he knows the process, but he doesn't remember, you know, how how am I supposed to take up the soap, apply on over my body. In that case, I ask the parents, you know, you can make, uh, take a picture and you can stick it inside the bathroom wherein he knows the steps so first we'll take up the soap applied on my hand again for this i take uh, you know modeling or i do a few of the activities in the session wherein uh, they will understand uh, like a simulated play 
uh, and again, for example, if I'm uh, applying on my hand, so counting, like let's count for one to five from top to the uh, to the bottom of my hands. Uh, so this concrete strategy helps them in understanding and uh, uh, they need to be consistent also in this. So help, it, it will help them in understanding, okay, these, this is the process and these are the expectations. And if we put a visual pictures of it, it will again be a better uh, understanding of that. Again, then the sensory integration skills, uh, how, uh, where the child lies and whether he needs a lot of proprioceptive vestibular stimulus, making a sensory diet for the child and we can include the family members here. I would and like to just interrupt them a... Mansi, please can you yes. wind it up quickly? Because the next speaker sure. may have to leave after some time. All right, all right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so you. we need to see uh, how the sensory skills are. Uh, in, in an aggressive child or in, in any child with ID, movement therapy helps a lot, which will which in turn reduce their frustration as well. So we need to improve their motor skills, perceptual skills, giving them, uh, you know, activities, uh, puzzles, uh, copying action, cycling. These are the activities which will, uh, you know, in a way improve their movement. So uh, engaging in uh, initially one-to-one -one social skills, which might again help them uh, see the expectations, model their behavior. So uh, pre playing a pretend play sort of thing, then including one or two children in a social group and then, you know, putting them in a larger group will help. Uh, play therapy uh, is again one of the important area to be, you know, practiced with children who are on ID. Uh, through play, we make them understand certain behaviors and what is expected, what is not expected. Environmental modification, like I said, if the child is uh, if the child has hypersensitivity, then making him eat with spoon using a long handled scrubber. Uh, so these are the few techniques, we, uh, few few modification which we need to consider, and the assistive technology. So we uh, for communication we have Avaaz app, we have picture exchange communication therapy. So all of these things we need to consider for an intervention for an occupational therapy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we'll rapidly go to the next speaker, Dr. Sir, Professor Suvarna. Please, can you have your uh, presentation? I understand you have yeah. to leave earlier. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I'm audible and uh, clearly audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank ma you. So myself, I'm uh, Professor Suvarna Ganvir. I am professor and head at the Department of Neurophysiotherapy at uh, Vikhe Patil College of Physiotherapy, Ahmednagar. And I'm um, happy and uh, thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my views on this particular case. Next slide, please. Um, as far as physiotherapy assessment is concerned, uh, there are two, three primary important issues that this particular case has uh, with respect to physiotherapy uh, treatment. Uh, one is the balance, one is the coordination, and one is the body awareness. Um, so as far as balance is concerned, there are a lot of um, aspects, there are a lot of approaches of uh, balance assessment, there are a lot of issues uh, that the child may face, um, whether it is a static balance, whether it is a dynamic balance, whether it is um, the anticipatory postural control or reactive postural control. So there are a lot of issues, there are a lot of aspects of balance which needs to be assessed. Uh, but the most gold standard scale that is used in the pediatric population is the pediatric balance scale. Uh, which is shown on the left hand side of the uh, slide and uh, this particular bi pediatric balance scale has got 14 components which involves the static as well as the dynamic components of balance and uh, the score is 56 and depending on the child with it uh, how does he perform on each component the child is uh, scored out of 56. So pediatric balance scale assessment can be done in this particular patient. Uh, second most important issue that this child uh, is uh, facing is that of coordination. So for assessment of coordination, simple, no, one sec, Hito, uh, can you go back, please? For the assessment of coordination, uh, simple assessment in terms of, uh, you know, um, one joint movements or a combination of movements, as you can see in this particular picture of the uh, child who is wearing this green shirt, a uh, combination of movements can be tested. Um, scientifically, coordination can also be tested with the help of uh, something called a speaker of eight test, which you can see in this particular picture of uh, the child, the girl who's wearing a pink shirt. So figure of eight is um, a tool which will help us to understand the coordination problems 
in terms of the speed of movement, accuracy of movement, the number of steps taken to per to complete the particular um, figure of eight, uh, figure, uh, figure of eight. Um, along with this balance and coordination, the uh, problem that is um, uh, revealed here is that of body awareness. Um, body awareness is a much more broader term which encompasses the other uh, aspects of um, the body function that is most importantly the proprioception and kinesthetic sensation of the child and along with that the body image. So body awareness is sort of an umbrella term which covers the uh, underlying issues of proprioception and kinesthetic sensation uh, perception of the child which needs to be assessed. Next slide, please. As far as the treatment is concerned, uh, since this child, next slide, please. Uh, as far as this particular child is concerned, he has primarily the problems with uh, uh, hopping and jumping and playing with his uh, peers. Next slide, please. So uh, since the child is able to walk on a level ground, um, we would like to start uh, with the um, exercises on the balance board, which you can see in the first figure, the second figure, uh, which is a balance board. So probably um, making the child work on his uh, uh, on his uh, on the unstable surface probably can um, improve his balance. Secondly, can um, secondly the child can be made to uh, stand on the uh, disc uh, and one leg standing can be given to improve his uh, static balance. Uh, thirdly, probably we can start with, uh, you know, throwing and catching a ball um, to improve his uh, dynamic balance al along with the uh, kinesthetic and proprioceptive sensations of the upper extremity and lower extremity. Uh, initially, we can start with the bigger ball and uh, later on we may move on to the uh, smaller ball so that uh, with the smaller ball the 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 motor control that is required is more uh, so uh, the progression can be in the form of um, having the child work with the smaller ball wherein he needs more of coordination um, along with that we can also start with something called as the obstacle walking uh, which you can see in the lowermost picture, uh, the child wherein there are obstacles uh, which are there. And uh, the, in this, the child has to um, step on those obstacles and um, thereby the child needs to learn to have the um, coordination between the um, upper body and the lower body, the coordination between the two legs um, when he's placing the uh, foot on the next obstacle. Uh, another way of uh, obstacle walking is you can see here in the uh, right hand uh, corner picture uh, where the child is made to stand in um, the squares, uh, the picture that you see with the red carpet here. Uh, in this, the child is asked to stand and walk on those particular uh, columns, um, the squares. Uh, that is how walking in something called as in a straight line, in a narrow base of support, uh, that would improve the coordination plus the balance in this particular child. Another way of uh, having the improving the coordination is in terms of walking over the obstacles, which you can see on the top, um, the right hand side, that is the cones are kept and the, the person is supposed to walk over those cones. So, you know, the obstacle walking, which would improve the uh, coordination uh, in this particular uh, child. So there are different ways by which the coordination can be improved. But finally, um, our aim is that in this particular child, uh, the two important issues, that is the aggression. Uh, whenever we are giving the exercises, we need to use uh, more of the reward uh, approach. That is, we give them some simple tasks and uh, which he is able to achieve and uh, give him a reward that, yes, you have done a good work and probably then move you, we can move on to a little bit of a more complex tasks. Um, in this, another approach that can be used is by having a peer in the treatment. So you can see in the lower bottom corner, maybe we can involve uh, another child of similar problem and maybe they can, both of them can work together on achieving a common target goal. 
but finally, our aim is that we need to have the child um, working in his or her peer group. So probably a group therapy wherein more of children are involved and probably they can work together. Okay. So that's all from my side, from a physiotherapy yeah, thank point you. of view. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Sumar, Suvarna. Thank yeah, you so we much. will quickly go uh, to the speech language pathologist. Uh, Sharanya, could you please introduce yourself and give a brief presentation? Because I think we have overshot our time for this absolutely, case. Absolutely, absolutely understand. Yeah. Uh, very good morning. I'll just take a moment to thank uh, uh, the organizing committee, uh, the Indian Psychiatric Society, and Isha, the Indian Speech and Hearing Association, uh, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on this case study. Um, as uh, I have put up in my profile, uh, I'm a product of uh, Sri Ramchandra Medical University, and I've had um, uh, roughly about 18 years of uh, experience in working with the pediatric population. Um, I enjoy my work. Um, it is it is tough, draining, and long drawn. Uh, but yet, yes, it is uh, something that I um, I go home happy every single day. I'm also an active member in the uh, at the Down Syndrome Federation of India and the Down Syndrome Support Health Association in Nepal. And um, I love um, going on camps and doing outreach activities uh, with the Federation. Uh, so moving on to uh, my uh, presentation, can we move to the next slide, please? The next one, yes. So the assessment is, um, uh, as always, uh, been informal, a combination of informal and formal assessment. Um, the formal assessment is uh, generally a standardized test tool to establish uh, the language level. And I, I generally go with the COMDIL assessment protocol for younger children uh, as uh, it is a very comprehensive in nature and helps us to you know establish a, a sort of a, a level which uh, forms the baseline for our uh, goals. Um, the informal assessment on the other hand would uh, involve parent interview, which again is I consider very insightful and um, uh, we uh, tend to gather a lot of uh, information about the child, the family, and uh, um, you know the uh, circumstances and the situations that the child faces on a day in and day out basis. And the uh, informal assessment also involves a fair share of observation of the child and its uh, uh, activities and skills. So the uh, primarily the assessment would focus on the prerequisite learning skills, the PLS. Um, the language profile, uh, profiling the child's comprehension skills and receptive, uh, that which is the receptive language and the expressive language skills. Another important component, which I never like to miss out, is the oromotor skills, evaluation of the vegetative skills, chewing, uh, blowing, um, you know, uh, the tongue movements, the placement of the articulators. So that is another um, uh, important area of assessment that I, I generally don't like to miss out. Uh, now, I have put up uh, uh, four uh, red, important red flags that I could, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, take out of the case study that was given to me. So the first being poor sitting tolerance, joint attention and turn taking, which would generally be assessed and uh, addressed during the uh, PLS, the prerequisite learning school. So this is where, you know, uh, uh, these these uh, 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 informations uh, lead us to believe that prerequisite learning skills, the PLS, facilitate learning in general and the development of speech, language and communication skills in particular. And failure of, you know, development of these uh, prerequisites can and do affect acquisition of speech language and communication um the next is the abuse language the third inability to follow instructions which again tells me that listening becomes an important goal uh throwing objects uh fidgeting moving around uh, is is another important red flag because this becomes a stumbling block during the therapy session uh, uh slc is unlike our uh, psychologist friends are not as experienced enough to handle these behaviors during the session. Although we see our children, um, you know, uh, very often uh, through a week, and the process is long drawn, as I as I uh, mentioned earlier. So it is uh, uh, imperative that we understand why these behaviors are being triggered and handle it accordingly, because it definitely uh, comes as a stumbling block during the therapy session. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So my therapy strategy, I would I wanted to highlight four important points here. Uh, that the activities that I choose 
uh, while training this child should be highly stimulating and interesting, considering the fact that the child is fidgety, the child moves around a lot during the session and has uh, not yet uh, as, uh, established his uh, pre-linguistics, pre-requisite skills. So it could be anything like water play, uh, sand activities, transfer activities, fun activities which involve uh, use of coins, magnets, um, the, the light, flashlight, torch activities that would high, be highly stimulating and interesting. And this information, again, I would um, gather from the parent, the mother. Um, the second one would be uh, keeping the parent inside the session. Now, this could work both ways, but I prefer to start by uh, involving the parent in the session. Um, one, because the child is aggressive and it would be helpful to have the mother along with me during the session. Two, also for the parent to understand um, the nuances uh, that are you know employed during therapy the, the therapy session it could be positioning the child uh, it could be how we present the stimulus uh, the de decision to change the stimulus at some point during the therapy these are uh, small things that the parents can make note of during the session if they are inside the session uh, the third thing is use of strong reinforcement and the fourth is to provide the child and the family with a good language model, considering the fact that the child uses abusive language, which probably has been wrongly modeled by the, the grandfather who also uses abusive language at home. And it is very, very important for, for us to uh, highlight the uh, benefits of being and providing good language models to children so that they pick up good language as well. So the goal plan would primarily involve uh, working on the prerequisite language skills for a long time, pre prerequisite learning skills for a long time until the skills are established and we are able to comfortably move on to um, language-based activities, which will again focus on comprehension. Uh, so receptive language is, is something that is under uh, rated and I think working on that helps the child develop a bank of vocabulary which they can withdraw for communication. So the language part would would primarily uh, involve comprehension of lexicals, uh, the concepts, use uh, understanding WH questions, polar questions, and most importantly, working on listening skills. Give the child sound based activities, help the child to listen and follow instructions and commands. The other thing that I would like to highlight that would be used during the child's uh, therapy session would be to use a lot of parallel talk to, to, to keep the language very descriptive so that the child picks up a lot of words and vocabulary from the therapist and the parents rather than using a lot of questions. Why this? Why that? What is this? What is that? This sort of overwhelms the child who is already... Um, uh, you know, uh, in short of uh, uh, words to communicate. And it also helps to uh, reduce the frustration due to uh, the, their inability to communicate. As much as uh, we understand that uh, uh, children with uh, ID are, are, uh, uh, have difficulty in, in understanding uh, and being, being uh, sensitive to their surroundings, I also do feel and believe that they are very sensitive to the fact that they are having limitations, especially with respect to communication. So use of visuals, giving them a binary choice with the help of flashcards or with the help of visuals greatly helps to reduce frustrations that, that come up due to inability to express themselves. So I would like to uh, end my uh, uh, presentation with this and uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sharanya. That was really nice and brief and succinct. Uh, for the last speaker for this case, uh, Ishita. Uh, Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Please go ahead. First and we, yes. we may have to wind up in a minute or so. I'm so sorry. We'll do uh, it. We'll do yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm Ishita Sakpal, clinical psychologist, art based practitioner, and working as a behavior therapist and special educator in Dilko Special School currently, and assistant professor in SND. Collier University, Department of Special Education, and I have more than 10 years of experience working with children with intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. Next slide, please. Uh, as a 
educator it is very very important for us to take the case history first and get to know what are the prenatal natal and postnatal cause and we just not work with the behavior issues or fine motors but it is also very important to look into the academics and functional skills that we are going to help the children with to live as independent as possible so we have a basic mr that is behavior assessment scale for indian children with mr that is id and it help us to understand what is the current level of performance of children and also help us to identify what are the problem behaviors similarly we have abs it also give us an overall view of what is the current level and which are the skill in which child the child is independent and which are the areas where the child needs help and also help us understand what are the maladaptive behaviors in the children and whether those behavior are frequently occurring or they are occasionally occurring and on base of that we set the goals and we plan our ips for the children as we see in this case there are lots of behavior issues with the, with this child and we want our children with special needs to be accepted in the society even if they have skills and if they have problem behavior there would be lot of issues where to achieve the skills to be in the classroom and to also be part of the society hence we can use abc where we get to know what is the reason behind the behavior and whether the action needs to be changed or the way the parents are responding toward the actions need to be changed like it was said said in the case that every day one fruity one chocolate and one ice cream has been given to the child and it is not provided there are lots of tantrum tantrums and behaviors projected by the child hence next slide please hence we need to have parent and family counseling here where as a special educator and multidisciplinary team we need to work with the family and being in india there are many family who stays in joint family there are very few nuclear families and we need to train the grand grandparents and siblings that how are they supposed to work with the child so that the special educator in the school the therapist in the school and the parents and family all together are using same strategies and method and equal reinforcement strategies for the child there need to be time out there need to be a token economy chart where we can give reinforcement to the child and child him self can be keep a record of his own behavior need to have an activity schedule where the child knows what is coming next and there will be break down activity there would be activity which has or of his choice we need to have communication need to plan activity according to the level of the child because sometimes activity are too simple or too difficult for the child because of which there are behavior in the child. we are not able to cater to the learning style what is the learning style of that child and teacher is using some different learning style because of which there is behavior need to teach you social stories regularly so that child understand what are the appropriate behavior and what is the right way to behave lots of sensory activities needs to be included in the activity so that the sensory needs of the child is catered to and there is less behavior issues and there is good attention span and sitting tolerance is increased sugar free diet need to be mentioned so that whatever diet or the tiffin is been sent in the school need to follow proper diets with medication provided by the psychiatric just medication won't help but complete diet plan proper counseling and proper behavior modification strategies need to be shared and need to train parents for it because child is going to spend few hours in the school but majority behaviors are coming from imitating the family members and the way the family members enforcing the child with regards to negative behavior and teaching appropriate ways to express emotions as we see children with intellectual disability do not have problem with communication but the problem is with receptive language hence expressive become difficult hence if taught the child how to express emotion how to take care of his own emotion would help to reduce behavior thank you so much I hope I'm stuck to my time. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we don't have much time. We have short by about at least twenty-five minutes here. Uh, I will hand over to Dr. Nidhi Joshi to take the second uh, case up. And speakers, please be very specific and brief and uh, to the point to the case. I think we are really running out of time. We do have a lot. you know i have a query and i think there's a query even on the chat box we'll try to take it up after the second case thank you thank you all the panelists who spoke for the first case thank you good afternoon everyone i'm now we move forward with the next case that is at risk specific learning disorders 
it is a very common disorder disease and early inter early identification and is very important so to identify who is at risk is very important so that interventions can be started earlier and it can help us so without taking much time i would uh, invite geeta dalal ma'am to present the case and uh, uh, with with us and then we will discuss it all later on over to you geeta ma'am हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस यू आर दी यस यू आर ऑडिबल ओके एम आई ऑडिबल नाउ यस मैम Yes, yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much for this platform. My name is Geeta, and I am a clinical psychologist and special educator. Today, I am going to contribute to this particular case as a dyslexia therapist. Also, can we have the slide, please, for the case? So, Miss Sheetal and Miss Simran are going to share with me as special educators. Okay. This is the case. of alex who is a 7 year old boy attending second grade in a mainstream school setting concerns about alex's academic and developmental progress were observed by his parents and teachers during routine assessments alex demonstrates delays in motor skills such as balance coordination and body awareness which impacts his ability to participate in physical activities and also sports he displays difficulty in manipulating small objects and fastening buttons and zippers next slide please thank you he struggles to sustain attention and focus on academic tasks for extended periods frequently becoming distracted or disengaged during lessons and activities he exhibits sensory sensitivities particularly regarding tactile sensations evidenced by his refusal to wear shoes which impacts his comfort and participation in various activities he displays poor handwriting skills characterized by inconsistent letter formation large font size irregular spacing and difficulty maintaining proper letter alignment within writing lines next slide please he often misspells words exhibiting challenges with phonemic awareness word recognition and b d reversals he has difficulty following written and verbal instructions often requiring repeated explanations or additional support to grasp new concepts or tasks He shows limited understanding of grade level concepts across various subjects resulting in academic performance below expectations for his age and grade level. While he can accurately answer questions verbally, he struggles to transcribe his responses onto worksheets in the written format. It is observed that he tends to push, pinch and scream in the class. while doing the worksheets so alex seems to have a lot of difficulties there are a lot of professionals going to work on this case and each one of them will give their inputs as a special educator i'm going to talk about the areas of where it mentions that academically he is not at par with the grade and age appropriate standards because there is no phonemic awareness he cannot write properly he cannot spell properly we are three special educators contributing to this case so each one is going to take up one area and i am coming to this area where phonological awareness is extremely necessary at 7 at age 7 the child has to understand that there are paragraphs each paragraph is divided into sentences sentences are divided into words words have got syllables 
And syllables have got the sounds. And if I don't hear those sounds correct, and if I don't have the connection between the sound and the corresponding letter, which will give me the written part to that sound, then reading and writing are both going to be difficult. So as a special educator, I would start with phonological awareness where there will be no reading, there will be no writing, and I will presume that he does not know alphabets. So whether he can hear the sounds properly, whether he can hear the syllables, like we have Dr. Nidhi here, so whether the child is able to sound out the word Nidhi and how many syllables are there? There are two syllables, Nidhi. So there are, you know, like Gita, Gita, like that. And then there is this word, psychology, psychology. Whether the child is able to distinguish that or not, then will come the next part into what sounds I hear in each syllable. Like if I'm saying Gita, what are the sounds I'm hearing? I don't have to read. I don't have to spell nothing. I'm just hearing Gita. Is the child able to say that I'm hearing two syllables, Gita? Gi has got G, E, and Ta has got T, A. That is what has to start with. So each phoneme, each particular sound, whether I can hear it, whether I can manipulate it, whether I can say the same sounds in another word. Can I have another word like Gita? Can I say Sita, Rita, Nita? Can I do that? Rat, cat, bat, mat. Or it could be nonsense word also. It could be something like Zoop. So if I'm saying, can you give me a similar sound at the start? Can he say Zoom with Zoop? Like that. So moving on from the start of the sound, then comes the end of the sound. Can I have a similar bit at the end of the sound? And then the medial sound remaining the same. It is only after that, that the phonics will come into place, where if I'm saying the sound G, what is G entailing? What is the design of G, which is actually just a design in every different language? In English, it will be G, which will be written like this. In Hindi, it will be G like this. So that written part, correspondence between the phoneme and the grapheme will come next. And phoneme-grapheme connection happening at a certain fluency only will be able to lead me to blend the sounds to be able to read a particular word. And when I am able to do that, only then when the word is seen in a textbook, I will again be able to do re the reversal process of dividing that word, sounding them out and reading them. And then similar pattern will go on to the spelling. And of course, there are many rules in spelling, which my colleagues will tell you a little about. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Simran ma'am, can we have a here? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma Welcome ma'am. Hi, uh, can, I, can we have the next slide? So I will just quickly go through the slide and then I can introduce myself a sure. little later. Okay, I'm a special educator and um, like uh, Geeta ma'am said, like she's got this very nice triangle there. So we will bring the comprehension part next. But uh, to have the comprehension in place, uh, we need to have a vocabulary first. So the vocabulary then would lead to the comprehension. So the ideally would be whatever she, whatever we are, are teaching the child, uh, right? We make sure that the child has the vocabulary in place now that phonics and phonemic awareness is done. Um, so we can so have different... Uh, we can have different uh, things we can do. I request everyone to please mute themselves so that ma'am can be audible. I request all the participants to mute themselves. Yes, Simran ma'am. Yeah. If we can have the next slide, it would be nice. If it's possible, it's there. Yeah. So we can have, uh, we can do vocabulary building by having vocabulary maps. 
right? Uh, we can have uh, word building games. We can have crosswords. We can have puzzles. So we build a vocabulary. Ideally, it would be whatever you are teaching to have that vocabulary happening first. So if you are teaching uh, any concept, you can have the vocabulary of the concept, right? Uh, you can have, uh, so if you're teaching a particular paragraph, you can have the vocabulary happening of the paragraph first. So first do the vocabulary, then go on to the comprehension part, right? For comprehension, we have also, we can use different strategies. What I've put up over here is the Roomba strategy that I use. That is reading the passage first, then the child underlines difficult words, right? And hopefully, since we've done the vocabulary, the difficult words would be a little lesser. But yeah, underlining the difficult words and finding the meanings of those words. After that, we can reread the passage for better understanding and then we answer questions, right? So uh, this is one thing that I do for comprehension, but you can make up your own strategies as you're going along. Right. Uh, so this is what we could do for comprehension. Uh, I think I'll get Sheetal in and uh, she can take over for uh, handwriting. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you, Sheetal, ma'am. Welcome to the session. And we would like to get her input on the writing part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think with Geeta, ma'am, and Simran speaking about comprehension and phonemic awareness, the writing becomes the next part in so very easily, uh, we have only uh, have to see if we have eye hand coordination. We generally use a lot of grippers. A uh, lot of pattern drawing is something that you can do with them, like you know, uh, pattern in sense of uh, start with normal scribbling to making circles to making patterns. Okay, uh, we can also use different texture. So for for example, I can use texture like sandpaper, or I can use a little rough sheets. I can use uh, water. Okay, so any any different medium of instructions could be used for the child to learn the movement of the of the letter. So, for example, if I'm teaching him A or a B, so you know the the movement of the letter. Uh, so you can use different textures for the child to remember because the more you use the sensory input. So, for example, the oral, the auditory, the visual, the kinesthetic, and the tactile. So I can also introduce some kind of a movement uh, to the child when he's writing the letter A. For example going up, then going down, then you know, from the middle, you, you cut the two lines. So you can use a lot of kinesthetic activities. You can use a lot of tactile activities uh, to for the child to learn the alphabets. Uh, generally for children, because they don't understand the visual spatial orientation, what we do is we can give them, uh, like we don't use the general, uh, you know, the, the books that they have, you know, where you have the, the, the red and the blue line books, you could use uh, the other, uh, other books which have little bigger spaces for them to understand the constriction of the hand when they are writing. So those kind of things can be done. A lot of coloring activities could be introduced where the child understands the restriction within the boundary to color. So these are certain activities where the child understands the boundaries. We are not supposed to cross the boundary even while writing, when you're writing the boundaries of your uh, lines which are there. Um, activities to improving a lot of fine motor skills. Uh, I think as a notice would keep up later. A lot of beading or things like that can be done with the child. Uh, improving visual spatial perception. Uh, you can use a lot of activities where you can, you know, what is the odd one out? So you can give two pictures, let them pick up the odd one out so you know whether he's able to understand visually how the things are, you know. And activities improving a lot of eye-hand coordination. So basically in the handwriting area, I would use a lot of the VAKT model, which we talk about visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile for him to understand the whole concept of writing. Thank you. Thank you so much, the entire team, the special educator, for the very interactive part. And now we are moving for, forward, and I would like to invite Dr. Alok Dani, ma'am, to kindly give her input about the intervention and assessment for this case particular. Alok, ma'am. Is she here? No. Yeah. She's 
Yes, sir. Okay, ma'am. You can just wait. introduce yourself and go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, I'm audible right now, right? Okay. Yeah, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is voice is coming quite low. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, is it yeah. audible? Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, a very good afternoon, almost. Uh, I'm Dr. Aloki Dani. So I've done my uh, MD Psychiatry and later on I've done my uh, fellowship, a uh, postdoctoral fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry from uh, Nair Hospital itself. Uh, currently, I'm working as a consultant psychiatrist in school and mental health clinic at Nair Hospital and, uh, and also in some of the private hospitals in Mumbai. And uh, moving on, uh, I know we are running out of time. So uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. So, yeah, next slide. Yeah. So, uh, as we just went through the case, uh, we know that the major issue. So, uh, but if we look at just the academic and attention issues, uh, there are a lot of uh, various reasons or causes which can lead to both of these kind of issues. So we need to uh, evaluate or rule out all these different kind of causes or reasons which can lead to academic and uh, attention problems. So we need to have a thorough history from uh, the parents or guardians and at times also from the school teachers or counselors and also a thorough history and uh, interaction and uh, examination of the child also. Uh, with all these things, uh, we can rule out different things. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, the next, yeah. The abnormalities, uh, if the child is having an envision, hearing or speech, which indirectly has a lot of impact on the uh, academic problems which the child is facing. Uh, we see many a times in our hospital itself that when the child in the wing or they are not aware if the child is having any hearing or vision problems and when they are examined, they are having a, a sometimes 50 or even 60 percent uh, with hearing impairment or vision impairment. Here in our hospital, uh, in our institute, we do follow this, that when the child is having any of such disabilities more than 60%, then uh, we do not proceed for any psychoeducational assessment for learning disability as such. Secondly, we also look if the child has had any uh, senus and cells in the recent past, like the child is having seizures or did have any senus infections, trauma, any head injury or any such kind of thing in the recent past. And if there is any temporal association of any such incident with the academic and uh, attention concerns with the child uh, is having currently. Uh, next, uh, we also definitely look into the intelligence of the child uh, because of which the child is having this academic and attention problems as such. And uh, so obviously we do some of the other IQ testing and we proceed for learning disability testing only, only and only if the IQ is normal. Uh, so basically as per definition and also as per criteria, SLD is disorder only if the uh, IQ is average or more than average. Next, are any ADHD uh, conduct or ODD concerns for the child. As in this child, as in the history, we have this one thing that the child is misbehaving in the school and also the child is having attention problems in, as specifically related to academics. Uh, so we definitely look, uh, need to look into any additional concerns regarding attention in any other settings as well, like uh, maybe in the playground or at the home. So which is one of the necessary criteria to diagnose the child of having attention or uh, ADHD or not. Also, if the child is having these ADHD or attention problems since the early developmental period or not, which is also one of the important thing if uh, we are supposed to diagnose the child as ADHD. If not, then there are many other causes uh, uh, which can lead to inattention as well. One of the cases, one of the reasons in this can be uh, because of the boredom or disinterest uh, uh, in the, uh, to study properly or having academic issues, which in turn can lead to boredom and disinterest and therefore avoidance of the study, which we, uh, we or anyone else can interpret the child is having attention issues. Okay. So, uh, secondly, if the child is having any emotional problems, any uh, punitive treatment at school, at tuitions, um, at home, or a lot of criticism that the child is receiving from school or from the parents at home, which in turn can lead uh, 
to you know all these kind of behavior issues or uh, inattention and that's why it's important to rule out all these things also before we diagnose a child with ADHD and yes lastly emotional issues uh, there can be many emotional issues depression anxiety or low self esteem uh, which can be because of any other stresses ongoing in the family like dysfunctional family or uh, bullying at school or in the tuitions which can ultimately lead to academic problems and attention problems or at the other hand it can be that because of academic issues and attention problems the child is having emotional issues so we need to rule out that thing and accordingly plan our management ahead um, yeah so yeah so in addition to these things ruling out these things uh, Uh, we need to assess uh, in the school and also as for the grade level of the child itself and also some reading exercise some math sums or uh, something so that uh, just a screening thing where we find that the child is having any uh, errors which looks like uh, learning disability or not and what other issues are is he facing in writing reading or maths in addition to that as for the history and examination which we get we can we can give them some rating scales uh, if required for adhd odd conduct depression anxiety etc last but not the least uh, observation or assessment report from school helps us a lot many a times the school uh, they do come with a school letter which just states that the child needs some assessment or psychoeducational assessment but we can definitely ask uh, them to go back to the school and bring an observation or assessment report from the school teacher or the counselor because they are most of the time the child is with the school uh, teachers and counselors so they can give a better observation report of what the child is undergoing for your and in brief which uh, we can do with this child uh, in this case uh, secondly uh, from the management perspective from a psychiatrist perspective as such yes firstly we definitely need to treat the adhd emotional issues behavior issues or any other psychiatric comorbidity with the child has before proceeding for any other psychoeducational assessment because if the child is facing with any of these conditions right now it is definitely going to interfere uh, with the further testings as such uh secondly yes uh, we we can refer the child uh, for uh, the iq testing to the intelligence testing and uh, to a psychologist and if the iq turns to be normal we can proceed further uh, for a proper um, lo learning disability testing as such thirdly uh, we uh, need to do a lot of referrals uh, for the child uh, as required uh, like we discussed before a ent specialist who check the hearing of ophthalmologist for any vision problems speech therapist if we feel that the child is having some speech problems articulation expressive or uh, com problems which can interfere in the uh, academics of this child uh, occupational therapist as we can Uh, as we saw in this case, uh, issues cross motor as well as fine motor issues, for which we definitely need to refer the child to occupational and a physiotherapist uh, for assessment as well as for management. And lastly, uh, we can refer the child to a pediatric neurologist if at all we feel that the child is having any dysmorphic features, which can be because of any syndrome. Uh, in this case, the child is having a lot of motor issues, which can also be due to a syndrome. Or uh, if the child has faced any recent sinus and sulcus, as we have discussed before. lastly uh, we definitely refer the child for the remedial therapy to a special educator or a psychologist uh, as we uh, just uh, learned from uh, yes. three special educators so uh, yes okay. i'm finishing my presentation here thank you so much thank you all of you ma'am uh, now i will request the ruchi yeah. bhamchari ma'am yeah. to I'm kindly not. present her all right yeah. um, so i think yeah. the special ed team and the psychiatry team has kind of done made my job very easy i'm ruchi brahmachari i'm an assistant professor at st javier's college i am the course director for the uh, ma program there um, i'm also practicing psychologist for the last 20 years and have had a very close i'm still part of the nair family even though a little far distant removed now but uh, i was a part of the ld team and i'm here representing the psychologist collective um my area of interest has been learning disability <laughs> Uh, a great privilege to get an opportunity to talk here um next slide uh, uh so i'm just going to say it's learning disability in a nutshell the role of the psychologist and the, the the team in general is to demonstrate um is there 
a difference in the academic performance uh, for what the cognitive capacity should be. So basically the role of the psychologist really is to establish the current level of the child's intellectual ability uh, and to see if there is a difference. So if you see, um, is the cognitive capacity high? So the heavier palra of the weighing scale and comparatively the academic performance is not commensurate. So, you know, those children who say, you're so smart otherwise, but you know, marks that gap that you see in terms of capacity and actual academic performance is where the psychology uh, or the diagnostic team really has to come in and to demonstrate what is the reason why this gap exists. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so as part of the psychological battery, a psychologist essentially will definitely have an IQ test um, that comes in. So demonstrating cognitive capacity, we have to rule out that the academic underachievement is not because the child just doesn't have the intellectual capacity so we're not dealing with a low iq child and therefore you know they have low cognitive capacity therefore the academic achievement is uh, reflective of that so we've got to determine that the intelligence is above um, you know is average or above um, and uh, as per a very recent government of india guidelines uh, there was a gazette that came out in uh, march 2024 um, they've listed out that for learning disability assessment so if you see the mullins iq the wisc4 um, the national institute of empowerment of persons with uh, intellectual disabilities has come out with an indian test of intelligence uh, the bine kama the vsms these are some approved standardized measures uh, through which this cognitive capacity has to be established by the psychologist in the case of alex uh, he's seven years old and so we've got to choose a test that will capture and so any of these tests really would be appropriate for a seven-year-old and to establish that he has average intelligence or above um, that would be the primary um, sort of goal um, if possible psychologists do get involved in psychoeducational assessments and supplementary domains um, so the NIMHANS battery for uh, specific learning disability um, assesses some of the processes that would help identify uh, underachievement uh, that contributes to learning disabilities. Um, the grade level assessment device is uh, another such. Um, so these are Indian sort of normed and developed uh, evaluations. Um, some other very popular psychoeducational tests that are still used in India, even though the norms are not necessarily Indian uh, based, are the Woodcock Johnson, which looks like reading, writing, and arithmetic areas. So your primary academic skills, um, the Wexler um, individual achievement test, wide range achievement test. So depending on the group, we may look at um, you know any of these tests to determine your primary academic skills of reading, writing, the three R's. You know the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, however, in school, children are learning lots of other subjects, and so that's where informal assessments, so reviewing of school records, looking at the child's notebooks, um, that's also something that kind of helps. Um, so as a psychologist, if you're working with uh, populations where learning is an issue, it's good to develop these skills, and our special educator friends and the teacher friends come in really handy to help us understand uh, what we're looking for in these qualitative sort of reviews of informal materials. Um, and then there are supplementary domains. So um, a major part of the psychologist's job is really to rule out that this academic underachievement is not because of the child's inability to focus in class, because the child is emotionally or behaviorally disturbed for X, Y, Z reasons, um, because memory is an issue, etc. Because these are all underlying processes that can still manifest as academic underachievement. So a very comprehensive battery of assessments may include uh, assessing for attention, assessing for language. Um, Gita Ma'am talked about phonemic awareness, uh, phonological processing, things like that. Um, a lot of neuropsych batteries do um, tap into these domains. Uh, visual spatial processing, Sheetal talked about coloring between the lines, etc. And if I have visual spatial deficits, I may uh, not be able to, um, uh, you know, sort of process information uh, visually and that could be why I can't spell or write correctly and emotional behavioral problems also yeah the C top test yeah, absolutely ma'am um, so um, this is really a chicken or the egg problem so are we looking at emotional problems or other difficulties that caused the under academic underachievement or is it the academic underachievement that is making me feel low and uh, you know um, I feel like I'm a failure, right? And that's where the, in terms of interventions next, the psychologist, once we have established 
what is really going on, um, you have to first differentiate, you know, um, make sure that the differential diagnosis is including, there's no um, processing issues of, you know, vision. So I'm not reading or I'm making reading errors, not because I have glasses that I have not uh, worn or I'm not hearing things correctly because I can't hear correctly. And that's what, um, you know, uh, Aloki has already um, sort of shared that we will rule out auditory and vision impairments. Uh, we will rule out intellectual disability or a slow learner because of low cognitive capacity. I think in our context, another very important factor is the language barrier. So are we looking at a first generation English learner, a child who has no exposure to the English language in the home setting and is the academic un underachievement because they just don't have exposure or they're coming from a language impoverished environment? Um, other common comorbidities that coexist, uh, like I said, the chicken egg issue. So in, in, a, in a culture where we are, um, you know, do good marks. Beta, apka right now, everyone is asking, na, final exam, mein kaise marks mile? Um, you know, for a child who is underachieving, that can really take, their self-esteem can take a beating. And so, um, you know, uh, common comorbidities of depression, anxiety, adjustment disorders, behavioral issues, ADHD, these coexist. And so we want to rule those out. Um, impoverished environment also in terms of just education in general. Um, am I just not exposed to the written word? I'm, I don't have access to a lot of reading material and therefore I just don't read enough it's like the muscle right if I don't exercise enough my muscle is not going to get weak so I will you know we got to rule out environmental impoverishment um, we have schools which are not really giving the children the best uh, learning opportunities so we've got to make sure that the child is going to a good school they are getting the right input they have the right environment and the academic underachievement is happening in spite of all of these things um, in place um, and uh, sometimes academic underachievement may be due to a high IQ score. So you have an incredibly high child um, because there is a discrepancy model. We are looking for a discrepancy between IQ and academic achievement. So if I have an IQ of 130, and my which is very, very superior, and my academic achievement is 110, which is technically like high average, I still have a 20 point discrepancy. So is that really learning disability uh, is the question that it's a debatable question um, because academic underachievement. So your academic skills below 85 is almost like a necessary. You have to be an academic underachiever to uh, say, yes, I have a learning disability. And so that's a debate that I think in, in psychology, we definitely um, face. So that's an issue uh, to put out there. And lastly, just in terms of interventions, uh, what would be my role the next? Uh, time? Sorry to interrupt, Ruthi, ma'am. Can you please just wind up a bit fast? Yeah, the last slide. The last slide. I'm just on the last slide. Okay. My okay. my slide has not been changed. Okay, and so really, as a psychologist, identifying the differential diagnosis, establishing cognitive capacity, and addressing any of the emotional or behavioral issues uh, would be my primary role in terms of interventions, and definitely referring to the special educators and psychiatrist uh, colleagues and collaborating with the school would be my uh, role. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruchi, ma'am. Uh, moving further, the, we have the occupation therapist, Dr. B. Balaji with us. Uh, so over to you, B. Balaji. I would request all the speakers to please concise their presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be part of this August gathering. Thank you for having me. I am Balaji, a pediatric occupation therapist doing my private practice for just more than 20 years in Chennai. Firstly, for this uh, kid, uh, Alex, uh, my problems related to occupant therapy are those sensory-based motor, uh, which is impacting his gross motor and fine motor. And it is coming in his way of his function, such as his physical activities in terms of sport participation. So there are you know, subtle signs of motor planning already. And then... We have this cognitive behavior in terms of the signs which he shows our inattention, especially getting distracted, disengaged during his lessons and activities. And some sensory sensitivities, which is seen when he's not able to wear his shoes. Yeah. Uh, and of course, handwriting concerns. So based on these problems relevant to occupant therapy, I will move on to my assessments. Uh, so, uh, as you all are aware, we use both a formal and informal assessments, and we are also moving away from 
standardized assessments, which we usually use for academic interest and for research purposes. So in a clinical setup or in a hospital setup, we usually use, or in a school setup, uh, where Alex is a school goer uh, doing his second grade, we usually use these kind of you know uh, informal assessment, which is very effective as well. Uh, basically, we'll be starting with a parental interview. As we you know, uh, you know get to know about, we need to have a baseline to check what are his primary concerns from the parental perspective. How about is his developmental history and uh, any other relevant medical uh, histories? As we talk to the parent, we also have to have an eye on the child about his physical appearance, his emotional well-being, uh, how is his exploration in the environment, is it uh, you know in the uh, therapy setup or in the uh, you know in the hospital setup to know about his you know play preferences. In usually in a OT setup, we will have in number of toys, in number of equipments where the child will be motivated or child will be you know enticed uh, you know unless and the child unless and until the child is you know has some other issues, the child will be motivated to see and try certain things. So, which will give us an idea about how is this, you know, a peak view about his neuromotor performances are. To test further, we immediately jump and, you know, have a rapport with the kid and then start showing certain various posture, usually anti-gravity posture and stability postures, which we will ask the child, you know, to copy and imitate, hold for some time and, you know, uh, check the timing and give uh, try and give certain resistance and see how well the core muscles are and uh, which will give us an you know idea about his uh, new <coughs> a sensory processing abilities uh, you know especially the vestibular proprioceptive and tactile processing which will also give us an idea about the cerebellar integrity in case of alex you you already see imbalance in in uh, imbalance in, in coordination and also decreased body awareness so just it, it gives us a you know you know a hypothesis about we need to look for his motor planning abilities since his participation in sports uh, you know is coming in his way of his function so we need to you know uh, 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 do further evaluation on his usage of two sides of his body that is right side and left side also upper and lower body coordinations so that's what we call it as bilateral motor coordination. So we may ask the child to do copy, how does he, you know, hop, how does he skip, how does he do a one leg stand. For a seven year old child, there are expectations the child has to hold that Superman position. That's what we call it as a super inflection you know, for 30 seconds for, uh, you know, for, the, for the child of the seven years. And for super inflection, which is, you know, shows us the quality of joint contraction where the child is lying on the back and curling his head, curling his trunk, curling, you know, fold, uh, you know, flexing the extremities. And that will give us an idea about this, uh, the uh, proprioceptive uh, system, which may uh, indicate trophosomatoid dyspraxia. So, which all gives us an idea about his postural control, motor planning abilities. So, these are, you know, previously called as soft neurological sciences, which is usually common in, uh, and then there is a growing evidence of, uh, you know, evidence showing that the soft signs are positive in children who are, who are at risk for specific learning difficulties. So these are the some of the things which will always, an occupant therapist will always look out for in terms of, you know, observation, in terms of clinical testing, in terms of asking to hold certain postures, and in terms of play. play. We also may give, uh, you know, if the uh, you know, school or the teacher is accommodative, since you know it is coming in its way of its function, especially in the school and academic performances, we would like to have the teacher rating on various domains. Let me not talk about various domains in those standardized assessments. Uh, and most of the signs and symptoms which will be covered in the standardized test are are that's the reason that uh, behind to take up these standardized tests. So uh, classroom observation or you know sensory processing measure in, in uh, uh, you know for the teacher to you know, tick on certain areas where his uh, performance is uh, uh, taken care. So emotional well-being is also being addressed, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of a sensory profile, sensory sensitivity, sensory modulation, especially with, uh, with regard to touch. Touch is the mother of all sensory system and this uh, comes in its way of its function. It has a disturbances uh, in its well-being, not, you know, uh, say, say for example, he may be fidgety, he may be little distracted or disinterested because he is unable to wear, it is not, well, you know, merely the shoe, it is because of the sock fabric. 
so the soft fabric can be usually it is a nylon or polyester so we can you know suggest sensory based intervention which will be coming in which will be followed up in the next slide so all this concerns can be captured with your with your parental questioners your teacher questioners in your sensory profile or in your sensory processing measure so uh, there is another unique uh, another uh, standardized test which we use uh, in uh, among occupant therapists which you are familiar which is done which is for, which is found by arna uh, you know observations based on sensory integration theory again this will take care of the integrity of the cerebellar you know the posture the other i uh, you know motor planning abilities which are very essential part of learning and which will you know have an impact on their academics and writing so uh, uh, apart from that uh, you must be uh, familiar with uh, peri vmi which definitely takes care of us uh, seeing and understanding motor coordination eye and coordination and the combination of these two these are time tests which are done in the you know worksheets uh, three minute test is your visual perception five minute test is your uh, uh uh vmi and you get your age equivalence to find out the difference and we can compare with the peers how how short he is falling when it comes to his uh, uh you know prerequisite skills for writing so he shows a lot of features of you know uh you know uh, inadequate letter formation large font size irregular spacing alignment etc so all this can be captured when we do an vmi uh you know the contributing factors for handwriting so as uh, the another uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, you know uh, standard test is uh, ths uh, as the name suggests we test your writing skill there are two components which we usually test it is from 7 years to uh, 16 and 16.11 years so it tests both manuscript and uh, uh, cursive forms uh, this this checks two components basically one is your speed and dexterity and your legibility so these are the two ingredients for a ideal handwriting so when we have these two then we know what exactly the child's age appropriate hand handwriting is so can we move on to the next slide please so my sorry to interrupt yes uh, yes just keep as brief as you can yeah, sure 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 for the sure 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 so my my frames of reference uh, OT management based on my frames of reference are, you know, uh, motor acquisition, motor and you know, acquire motor skills, especially your gross motor, fine motor, as well as sensory based, uh, sensory based behavioral issues. So we use these frames of references by, you know, uh, engaging the child, uh, making the child participate in various uh, uh, motor and uh, uh, gross motor, fine motor, and behavioral strategies. so as you all know these are all called the top down approaches where we work at the problem and uh, you know enhance those uh, uh, and the most commonest approach we use for uh, specific learning difficulty especially the way he shows a lot of visual motor and uh, visual perceptional issues we may you know uh, you know work with the child with you know a lot of uh, worksheets and engage with uh, you know fine motor activities such as you know scissor skills you know especially Uh, you know involve the thumb and the index finger which is a which is a as you all know the you know human homunculus has a big representation of the thumb and fine motor is of utmost relevance for us so we engage the child's uh, fine motor ability especially the pincer grasp and it has to develop in the very first of the very first year of their life so usually we don't see that kind of a mature development in in the child in children with sld even when they are between 7 to 9 years so uh, <clears throat> you may be already aware of uh, various activities uh, you know this is more of you know participating and engaging and practicing these skills for fasteners and buttons so i will quickly jump to uh, uh, the handwriting uh, uh, sessions so we i i usually uh, we, i usually use a structured approach we usually use uh, something called handwriting without peers curriculum so this is a structured approach again designed by nokup interface jane olson and this is a certification course where this is a developmental approach and it uses sensory uh, various sensory uh, 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 avenues uh, multi sensorial we can call it and this is got uh, the uh, the uniqueness of this feature is you know it uses step by step instruction so children have follow you know problem following instructions in case of uh, alex he has problems following instructions so the the task has to be divided into step by step instructions which is very very helpful 
and it has got a lot of uh, visual cues and we use multi sensorial we use you know touch we use auditory we use you know so many other and we make it very simple when, since they also have the spatial issues we don't you know start a state of it start training them in four lines rather we start uh, train them in two lines so for example we have something called a you know a smiley stare where we have a you know, definite start at the right and you know, left and top of the corner with the smiley uh, smiley so we always starts from you know one uh, commonest start that is your left and top corner and it always from top to down left to right sorry to interrupt sir uh, we have to just move over to the next uh, speaker so sure. thank you so much sir and uh, i would like to talk to chetna kunde madam the physiotherapist yes. ma'am to give her yeah. inputs on this case yeah. and uh, yeah. just uh, two three minutes if you can sum up yes yes good afternoon good afternoon am i audible yes yes ma'am uh, yes i am an associate professor in the school of physiotherapy bharti vidyapeet so my first slide please next next yes uh, as we looked at the child allen he has a problem with physical activity and the sports and we could see that the balance coordination body awareness tactile hypersensitivity which is one of the point uh, pointed thing and the attention which is all impacting or uh, his physical activity in the sports we would like to have an assessment more of our observation we start with lot of observations then parent questionnaire such as sensory profile can be done to find out which area is affected and uh, to find out whether the tactile hypersensitivity is a problem there and lot of motor assessment motor skill assessment scales that has the movement assessment battery for the children uh, it consists of checklist and the motor test with both designed to assess child motor skills in everyday activities and this assessments are motor skill uh, such as ball skills and balancing and other then another is p body developmental tool this also uh, assesses the gross motor skills of the child and uh, uh, the bot2 school uh, tool which will assess the perceptual motor skills of the child which is measuring the balance ability strength fun activities uh, standing on a small balance being hopping and other activities so i just want to say that uh, researchers has even saying that a dual task balance assessment is very very important uh, to be taken into consideration when we are checking for the balance in children with learning disabilities so in this um, dual task balance condition uh, the cognitive activity is to be incorporated such as standing with two feet together and counting backward because uh, sdl uh, children is uh, having a problem maybe having a problem with automatization and the conscious compensation so this is proven to be a best tool to assess the balance in the children and another thing attention we don't usually do in our pt settings but uh, for just to information for the pts that we can do for a, a digit span test along with the reaction time so that we can assess the attention so our goal based on activity and participation next slide please so uh, we can set a goal based on activity and the participation of the child uh, such as uh, walking for a 20 steps from the school gate to the class with a backpack without losing balance in 2 minutes and such as kind of we can also plan for the sports so the treatment basically to uh, pt treatment are Uh, to achieve these goals, basically focus on motor perception therapies such as gross motor activities. We do a lot of catching, throwing, kicking, jumping, swinging activities. We also work on body awareness, that is pointing out uh, the identifying and pointing out the body parts, performing tasks using body parts, walking between the narrow spaces between the two benches, and these things. Sensory integration therapy. we must also as the child is having tactile hypersensitivity we can do lot of uh, textures we can lot of uh, brushing and other uh, these things and incorporating with the play and other equipments into it to work on these areas again uh, group based therapy yes we practice lot of group based therapy in our clinical setting and yes it works very well uh, this is what i have noticed and our researchers are also saying to focus more on group based interventions for the children then process oriented approach motor imaginary trainings these are also coming now uh, very well into 
the picture that problem uh, process oriented uh, approach basically understands uh, in a process that the child must understand carefully about what is to be done and how is to be executed. That means the uh, whatever the therapy which we are going to give him must be explained to them whatever the activity has to be done and how to be done. And motor imaginary is that, that before performing the task, the child has to uh, tell that how are you going to plan or see, uh, imagine how are you going to plan the activity and then you're going to perform. So nowadays, re virtual reality is also coming into a role play where they're saying that uh, it is very much helpful for uh, improving the gross motor abilities and the skills in the children and uh, play-based uh, therapy or game-based therapy. Another thing, task-oriented approach is uh, again very, very important uh, to achieve uh, these uh, uh, functional abilities, activities, and their participations. So repeated activity of the training and the task is very, very important for the children to achieve these things. Am I audible? Uh, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Chetna, ma'am, for the, this, uh, giving your input in this. And now the lastly, we have the Deboshita Gupte, ma'am, the speech therapist. Uh, we can just present his slide. And be concise as you can, ma'am. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, IPS. Somebody's annotation is on, so this is happening with the ma mouse, somebody's mouse. I am Debo Smita Gupte. I am a clinical practitioner for the last 14 years. I am a speech-language pathologist. We'll move on. We'll go on. The next slide, please. I've started making materials for all our neurodiverse kids as well for the purpose of language development. Next slide, please. From the uh, SLP perspective, what we are looking at, Alex, is I have made this pyramid to understand uh, look at both uh, uh, concern areas for assessment as well as management. We all have our informal assessment structure, formal assessment structure to determine the language age of the child. However, in the bottom rung of the pyramid, I have very clearly put attention and arousal. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. The reason being from the description in the case history, uh, just press the mouse again, it's an animation that will come up. So it is an inverted U, inverted U curve when the crest of the curve shows the optimal arousal level at which we can work at core speech language as well as literacy tasks. The upslope, which is the upward red arrow, which shows the uh, input, the ample and the apt input that our OT and PT uh, colleagues just spoke about because this child very clearly runs on a cholinergic deficit system at molecular level. So bombarding the child when he's at suboptimal arousal level is just going to put an unjust demand on the child, furthering his uh, anxiety and increasing his frustration. So once those are taken care of and we get to the peak of this optimal arousal, can we work with core speech language goals? So the next one, next slide, please, is emotional regulation. So depending on the state and which issues we are working at on uh, with the child, we could be labeling or we could be identifying anger triggers. We could be working at the solutions. We could be looking at the size of the reaction and so on and so forth, depending on the situation. For the purpose of attention and arousal, as well as emotional regulation, both the parent as well as the child has to be trained in order to understand his own state of the body state of the mind and the parent has to understand that you cannot just surprise the kid with whatever tasks you have planned so these are exercises which were covered both by the otis and peaches very beautifully required to be done for the body to be able to allocate essential and enough number of cognitive and uh, cognitive faculties next comes starts with the core speech and language task which requires a lot of attention and lot of demand placed on the child is auditory attention and executive functions it could be uh, if we start off the session it, you know this is roughly how a session would also look like with us it could be visual then visual aided with auditory then finally moving on to integrated attention so to help the child cope in a classroom setup Depending on the state of the child on a particular day that we are working, it could be a sitting or a movement-based activity. If it is movement-based, it is highly beneficial because the child gets more proprioceptive depending on the texture on which he's walking and kinesthetic feedback, which again helps a cholinergic deficit system to work with us. Then comes phonological awareness, which has been amply covered by the uh, special educators. We also use a bottom-up approach in helping the child with the GPC, the grapheme to phoneme conversion, as well as word borders, breaking down words, breaking down phrases that he's saying but is unable to read and so on and so forth. 
then comes the meta language skills the meta linguistic metacognitive skills and the perspective taking there we focus a lot on narrative practices and syntax so i've put up an example of a simple sequence of a child running slipping and then falling apart from working on the morpho syntax the tenses and everything and the length of the utterance we can actually work at generating ideas of there can we discuss three ways in which the child could have fallen how could he fall you know in a similar fashion inside the house in this case the picture is outside the house so this is how we generate more lines of thinking if the both the arousal as well as the anxiety is taken care of and the last one that i have put is speech to text as a you know a feed forward system so as a speech language pathologist when i am working on phonological awareness or more uh, often than not the narrative practices with perspective taking in meta language i can just have a software on with a google mic which basically transcribes all that the child is speaking so what happens is later even a talk back system can be used that is text to speech which helps the child in understanding what i think and what i talk can be transcribed so a child who has a lot of fine motor issues and has reading writing issues as well is going to look at writing as a big mental block so you know as special educators teachers parents you're going to say you know you have to write you have to write more to get better at writing but writing as a whole is a very big mental block for me in terms of the physical necessities as well as the actual writing and reading processes the speech to text software very simple very cheap highly available in all our phones is a very efficient system in breaking the barrier and it also gives the child autonomy dichotomy in understanding my thoughts privatization of my thoughts and my speech understanding that after the thoughts it is the internalization and privatization of thought after which the sentences are generated and i have complete control over the sentences which i am generating so this is how our management pattern would look like after assessment thank you so much thank you thank you so much devasita ma'am and it was a really a great presentations thank you to all the panelists for giving their inputs insight into the at risk slb case and uh, uh, i would now over to the jyoti madam yeah thank you very much i think uh, it was a wonderful presentation thank you devasmita uh it has been an exhaustive morning actually we had planned it to be a little briefer i know we overshot the time it's a learning experience for us and as i said like you know please put in your feedback in the feedback forms you can give us suggestions for cases even probably send in a case uh, vignette with your name so that we can present it as such and uh, develop the uh, you know the therapeutic areas that need in, i mean you know which uh, are part of the interventions and have uh, it all discussed in the panel uh, thank you everyone especially the panelists dr prajakta mansi joshi mansi kadam uh, suvarna sharanya ishita the second case uh, panelists uh, dr nidhi who coordinated um, geeta dalal ma'am who came up with a wonderful uh, case actually the case vinet uh, the speech ed uh, special educators with her uh, suman and uh, simran and sheetal Dr. Alauki, Ruchi, Balaji, Chetna, and Dabushmita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alka, ma'am, actually for giving us a lot of inputs and feedback, and of course, uh, you know, keeping on pinging uh, with regards to the time. She is not here for the vote of thanks, so I am doing uh, that uh, instead. Uh, I thank all the panelists. I thank all the you know the you know people who have logged in. I think we had at least one hundred and sixteen at one point in time. and uh, several at least 70 stayed on till the end for the two cases i thank ips west zone branch uh, for providing us the tech support for having this webinar and we continue to do this it will be the next one we hope to do it uh, i know the tech support has uh, problems having it on a sunday morning but that seems to be a convenient time for everyone to log in so the next one would be uh, you know in on the 2nd of uh, june uh sunday morning uh for all the panelists and all the people out here please you can put in suggestions for the cases that you would like to be discussed uh just a reminder that when we are preparing i mean the format would be this where there would be a case discussion which would be a little more elaborate and intervention which would be briefer that is two slides so the first one would uh, the presentation would be with four slides 
please keep the cases in mind when you are talking about intervention so it is specific i think there was a suggestion i'm sorry we can't take the queries in the chat box but there was uh, avani's suggestion that you know what about psychoeducation what do we specifically do and when we are talking about people in you know in different areas we are probably not having access to all the multidisciplinary therapists uh, you know a brief sum up of what we can do for people who are seeing such a case what is the basic psychoeducation that you can do what are the simple tips for behavioral it could be the psychologist intervention it could be the speech therapist but what where can we guide them that i think would be something that would be practical and very useful for us i know it is very elaborate your interventions are much more elaborate and it has been discussed but probably the next uh, few sessions that we plan to have could be very focused on the cases so that we know that when we get such, such an index case it could be like a prototypical case and this is what we can do at our level i mean for example for me a lay psychiatrist probably sitting in uh, a semi urban area you know what are the tips that i would uh, use in terms of uh, helping the child who comes to me and who obviously will not be able to access any of the multidisciplinary teams uh, so thank you very much i am uh, apologies if i have missed uh, thanking anyone and uh, have a good weekend thank you so much for logging in thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am it was very well done thank you yes thank you thank you so yeah. much everyone bye yes i think a home based program yes thank you thanks a lot thank you